to commas. Commas is all things tech. Culture and technology coming together. Life hacks. The practicality right now in the inefficiency of the internet of buying and selling stuff is extraordinary. Entrepreneurship advice. I think the first thing is you got to understand your business inside out. Love and tech. We've almost reduced dating to kind of this very momentary snap of a person. It's going to be a fire show. I have yet to see something these days that's truly differentiated. New advice and new inspiration every show. It really is about the next generation of creators going faster, further than we did. And now, Sequoia Blodgett. Now let's start stacking them commas. On this episode, we chat with Andrea Moore, who fills us in on how she's been able to hold down jobs at the largest tech companies in the world all while getting her business degree from Harvard and starting her own tech organization. It's going to be fire. Entrepreneurship advice. (laughs) Learn from the hottest and most successful investors, founders, and innovators in the game. Determine your greatness. It's time to get your knowledge up. Okay, okay, for sure, for sure. What's poppin'? We've got Andrea Moore on the line. She's worked at pretty much every major tech company on the planet. Founder of Black Tech Women, Harvard Biz Grad. I mean, the list goes on. Girl, you are popping. What's going on? (laughs) Thank you, thank you. Uh, probably doing too most the most out here. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, before we get into all of the details regarding your journey, I want to know specifically from you your background into tech. So, how did you get to the point of actually working in tech? Uh, sure. So um, I started my career in marketing research at the Nielsen Company, and my clients were in the consumer packaged goods space. And so what's typical in that industry is that you have a brand planning meeting where you try to plan out the next five years. Um, And so in that brand planning meeting, um, most of the brand managers at the time who had multi-million dollar marketing budgets uh, were discussing an ad that had gone viral on YouTube. This was back in 2010. Um, No one realized why it went viral, um, but they just knew they needed to do it again, but they weren't sure Um, how to do it. And so in that moment, I thought, okay, I'm sitting here with people who have million dollar marketing budgets who don't understand what's happening in this new space at the time. I need to go work in that industry. Um, And so what I did is I applied online, which I don't recommend, but I applied (laughs) online uh, to a few different tech companies. So Facebook, Google, um, LinkedIn, and um, actually heard back from Google, interviewed and started there as a SMB sales manager uh, focused on Google AdWords. And so that was my start into tech. Um, did that for two years. Then I transitioned into product marketing, still focused on small and medium businesses and uh, continued to build my skill set and my network in the space. So I did three. So I did marketing research and then I did three years at Google Um uh, decided to go to business school uh, because I saw people were um, doing product management um, and that was really considered the product owner in the industry. And so I knew that going to business school would position me well for that role. Um, and so I ended up going to Harvard Business School, um, interned in product management at Apple, had a good experience there and then joined uh, full time. And so I did a little bit of product uh, product marketing and analytics at Apple, and then I transitioned to Facebook um, back into product marketing. And um, I've been there for the last 18 months. That is insane. So I want to back up a little bit. So when you said that you had applied online and you were submitting all these applications, what was the feedback like? Because you said that you wouldn't recommend people going through that process. So, so tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> Everyone out there, do not do that. I was young and, like, did not know that you should get referred. Um, so I actually did not hear back from Facebook. So no rejection, no anything. Just didn't hear back. Um, same with LinkedIn. Uh, but with Google, for some reason, I don't know, um, a recruiter actually did reach out to me to schedule um, a first-round interview. So um, this was a phone screener just to learn more about my background, what, my interests were, uh, my skill set, things like that. Um, And then she recommended me for um, the SMB uh, sales role focused on digital marketing for Google AdWords. And so 
that's what happened. And the reason why I say don't do that uh, is because a lot of these tech companies get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of applications Mm -hmm. uh, every day. And it's a lot easier to refer because those applications kind of, you know, get put to the top of the pile and pretty much guarantee a resume review, not an interview, but a resume review um, for the applicant versus applying online does not guarantee uh, anything, to be honest. (laughs) It guarantees you to sit in the pile. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. Get lost in the pile. (laughs) Right, right. So you said you went to business school after the fact. So what made you decide that you wanted to go back to school? Um, yeah, so I, as I mentioned, so I was doing marketing research, consumer packaged goods, so I had um, some good analytical skills, um, and then I did sales, and then I did product marketing, but when I looked at my overall skill set, I did not have exposure to finance, like financial modeling, um, which I knew was a, a core skill to have if I wanted to continue my advance, to advance my career in business in general. Um, I also wanted to try out product management, which um, if many people if people don't know this, typically uh, they want you to have a technical background. So either be an engineer or um, a data scientist or a technical program manager, um, and then moving into product management. But one way around that is um, don't accept people who have gone to business school and um, kind of have built skills around um, stri- like strategy, relationship building, um, modeling, things like that. And so um, that was the reason why I decided to go to business school. I really wanted to transition into product management and was ultimately able to do that um, with an internship at Apple. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your experience at each company. What would you say the company culture was like? Sure. So the, the company culture is definitely different at um, each of the companies. And so um, I would say with Google, there is a big emphasis on um, scalability, right? So uh, if you test and launch something in one market or for one customer segment, um, you optimize it and you get it right. And then the goal should be to scale it across as many customer segments or as many regions as possible. And so um When it came to that, uh, within Google, for example, um, one project I worked on was focused on training um, some of our new sales associates. And so I tested out in the U.S. It did pretty well. And then I partnered with teams in Latin America and Asia Pacific to actually scale it to those regions. Um, When it comes to Apple, um, they have a big emphasis on um, design and I would say ruthless prioritization, right? And so <laughs> there's, they're really big on making sure the product offerings that they have in the market, um, from both a hardware and a software point of view is as simple and, um, focused on the customer and the user as possible. Um, and that all of the products are very seamless. And so, um, they, that ends up meaning that there could be some, uh, projects that are prioritized, let's say, for the next year or the next two years because they want to make sure that they get it, you know, almost near perfect mm-hmm. and um, it is super ready and close, you know, close to perfect as possible when it launches. Um, Facebook, I would say, has a test and iterate culture. And so, um, you know, you want to get the, the product right and ready to go, but there's oftentimes where it's just like, hey, Let's go ahead and test it. Let's do an A-B test. Let's um, make sure we have the right metrics in place. And if it drives the metric, um, then we'll launch it um, at 100%. Um, and so that's very different from uh, the other two where there's, uh, there may be some internal testing, right, before launch. But uh, there's never kind of external testing where Facebook is heavily focused on testing and iterating and then launching. That's interesting. I love that because they're just like, we're just going to figure it out. <laughs> like, Do they like it? Yeah, at the, yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Do they like it at the minimum vital, viable product stage? Yes. No. OK, right. cool. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> How much autonomy do you have working for a tech company, especially a company like Facebook? So this might sound like Facebook Kool-Aid, but um, I actually have a ton of autonomy in my role. Uh, and so 
that's one of the, the reasons why uh, when I was looking to leave Apple, I um, inter- like had informational interview Victor with a lot of different companies. And one thing that stood out about Facebook is the fact that you can have a lot of autonomy. It's a very bottoms up culture. And so it's on you to kind of, you know, take initiative. If there's a project that you think is relevant for your area of the business, then, you know, no one's stopping you. Like no one will tell you no. So it's really on you to secure, you know, resources and things like that to execute, but no one will really tell you no. And that has been true. Like that's been true of my experience since I've been there. So I really like it. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think it can be challenging sometimes because, you know, it is it is on you to really kind of figure it out. Um, and you don't have as, as much, you know, guidance and things like that. And so you have to take a lot of initiative. That's interesting, but they've hired the right people, so they get it. <laughs> like <laughs> they vet it really hard. So you started Black Tech Women. Talk about that launch and why you decided to start that organization. Yes. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, I've been in tech since 2011, and um, there were a few Black women who I worked with at Google in the sales org. Um, but after two years, they um, they transitioned. They completely left the industry. Um, and a lot of it was due to um, lack of representation, lack of advancement, um, limited opportunities. Um, and that just that felt like it was a consistent experience um, across our team. And, and then when I went to business school and, you know, I interned at Apple, um, when I joined for my summer internship, literally I was the only black woman in that building. Wow. And when I came back full time, I again was the only black woman in that building. And I thought like there has to be like there has to be more of us um here in this industry industry. I've worked with some of them. Um I know I've seen some people at events, like what is going on? Um and so that that was kind of one kind of personal anecdote that was happening. Um and then in general there was a movement in the industry to really focus on um, diversity and increasing representation across a lot of big tech companies. And so Google had released their diversity report. Um, Facebook had released their report. So companies were, were um, spending some time focused on it, but the conversation never transitioned into being intersectional, right? So there would be data on women and data on black people, <laughs> and not data on black women. And so I felt that the conversation wasn't including us. Um, and so even with a lot of the women um, in tech groups, I feel like there was just a strong lack of uh, representation. So in 2017, um, I got the idea and I was just like, hey, well, I'm just going to create a group, uh, a Facebook group, actually, <laughs> um, uh, for us to come together and connect. And so March 2017, started the group, added in people who I knew, like the few people I knew who were still in the industry, um, and then it grew organically for the next year or so. Um, And so then we, you know, have had events. Uh, We have a Medium page where we feature different founders, um, different professionals, um, and it's just been, you know, a great experience where people can have a, where Black women specifically can have a resource to connect with each other to get news, to share thoughts, to share opportunities, you know, discuss like negotiating their salary, things like that um, in a safe space where where they can do that. And so now it's a little bit over 3,000 members. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, I love that anecdote that you shared earlier in regards to you being in this space and feeling basically alone. Talk a little bit more about that feeling and like what, Mm -hmm. you know, like what did that bring upon for you? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's like, I don't know if people realize like the images that we kind of see day in and day out and the toll that it can take on you. Um, and so I think for me, you know, I would kind of look up, <laughs> like physically look up sometimes and see the leadership teams, um, even at the manager level, right? So not that senior, but even at the manager level and not see, um, black people and then specifically black women in those roles. And so, um, early in, earlier in my career, I thought, okay, well, does this mean that, you know, I can't be um, at that level, even mm. though, you know, in college, I 
like undergrad, I'm like, yes, I'm going to be a business leader. I'm going to be an executive. You know, I'm super pumped. And then coming out into the industry and literally not seeing anyone, um, it feels very like defeating, right? You know, um, to not see that. And so I think, you know, me personally, I like to be kind of that person for other people. And then um, also creating that space where we can empower each other and be a source of um, inspiration for each other. And, and it was like, you know, just helping, just helping each other out until we can get more representation at uh, both mid and senior levels. That's awesome. I think it's so important that you see people that look like you at an executive level, like you were saying, because you don't feel like you can achieve that if you're not seeing that type of representation. So within your organization, do you feel like now that you're you've built this community, you're seeing that type of representation? And do you feel like there's a mentorship type of situation connected to it where you guys are kind of helping each other grow into those type of roles? Mm -hmm. I I see there's there's been a little bit of movement um, in terms of seeing that representation grow. Um, I think we still have a long, a very, very long way to go. Um, in terms of mentorship, this happens quite informally, right? And so um, the entry, close to entry level, early career professionals, um, I've ad hoc had conversations with them, uh, with some people who are at uh, a level or two below Below me, I've helped them get um, full-time offers at different companies, and then also help them with negotiating their level and compensation. So that's a big piece, right? So even mm-hmm. if we are represented, we can come in underpaid or um, underleveled. And so kind of nipping that off, like out like at the beginning is a, a good starting point. And so those types of um, conversations, one-off, um, have been great. I do think there's an opportunity to kind of scale that, right? Um, so making sure there's a um, more skilled approach for those conversations to happen, for the doc- the data to be documented, things like that. And so uh, we are thinking about that for the future. I love that. So you do see yourself growing Black tech women. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to see where it goes because I think that that conversation is so necessary. I mean, we see the Valerie Jarrett's of the world. We see like all of these different women, but like you're saying, the representation is so slim. And for you to be in that ecosystem and not see anybody like, (laughs) like, did you find yourself assimilating because you were in that type of situation? Um, I think there's some like, limited assimilation that will happen just based on company culture and how decisions get made. Um, so I, I, I do think there's, you know, that kind of naturally happens. Uh, but in general, um, I try to be my authentic self as much as possible, as people say. So, and I feel like at um, the different places I work, I've felt more or less my authentic self. Um, I'm happy to say at Facebook, <laughs> I have felt more like myself uh, than any of the other places that I've worked. And so that's been um, pretty refreshing and nice to feel you know, supported and even more of myself in um, my day to day work. I love it. Facebook has definitely taken initiative to champion diversity. I mean, like you said, the numbers are still very far in terms of growth, but they've definitely trailed that path for for a good amount of companies to replicate as far as I'm concerned. So that's really, really positive to know. Um, So I want to know, obviously, you've done all this. What are the plans five years from now? Uh, I hate this question. (laughs) (laughs) What you doing, girl? (laughs) um, Yeah, I'll be completely honest. I think for my personal plans for five years from now, oh man, I I feel like it changes. It changes every day. Um, One thing I will say is that I recently completed um, first round uh, angel track program. Oh, yes, yes. um, Yeah, and so what they do is they, you know, give emerging angels, as they say, um, a broader understanding of what angel investing is, how you should think about founders, business models, markets. Um, You learn from each other. There's a cohort of 16 people. Um, And so I knew that um, I would want to understand more about investing in the future. And so that's been top of mind for me right now and figuring out who, you know, do I want to invest in as an angel? 
Um, and so that could be something that I can, like, I will definitely continue doing that over the next five years. But what that looks like in terms of angel investing or VC, I think that's, you know, up for debate. Um, I've been in product marketing for the majority of my career. And so that um, continues to be an area of passion for me. And then for Black Tech Women, I see it being, I see it continuing to be a major part of my life and being super focused on what we do in terms of event content and then relationship building so we'll see like all three right now can i say all three <laughs> i don't know if that's sustainable <laughs> yep. but um, that's kind of those, those two things have been top of mind for me um probably over the last six months it's like these are the three areas that i'm super passionate about i love it how are you balancing it all so my best friend is google calendar <laughs> <laughs> um and so what I do is I uh, I block my time. And so I make sure like every day of the week, like Monday, Saturday, Sunday, in the evening, I block my time. And I'll, during the day is, is, of course, dedicated to Facebook. But before work and after work, I'll have blocks for either, you know, event planning for Black Tech Women, for posting content, for reviewing, you know, medium posts, for setting up uh, meetings with different partners. All of that is kind of blocked throughout my free time. Um, And that includes also blocking personal time as well to make sure that I do still have some time, some Mm -hmm. personal time for myself. But Google Google Calendar is my best friend. (laughs) Before I let you go, I want to get into first round angel because I totally forgot that you had done that. So tell us a little bit about the program that you went through. Yeah, um, and so it started spring 2018 um, with the initial group in San Francisco, and then expanded into uh, to having a cohort both in SF in New York in fall 2018, and then I recently completed the spring uh, 2019 cohort for SF. Um, what they do is they they look for people who are either former founders, let's say. You know, they recently started a company. Uh, maybe the company has been sold, um, or maybe not. You know, there's there's people in the New York cohort who haven't sold their company yet. But then they also look for people who have operating experience. And so, in my cohort, there were people who represented strong product marketing experience, sales, engineering, supply chain, finance, etc. Across uh, different companies. So, Facebook, Skype. Like, where Airbnb, who, Dropbox, right? So a lot of different um, tech companies are represented. And then what we do is we meet every other Wednesday and we have a speaker that comes um, who's typically a well-established investor. Um, so maybe they do angel investing, but they also do just venture capital investing in general for, for their career. And they share their personal strategy for how they approach different founders, um, different companies, things like that. And so as they're sharing their perspective, um, we get an opportunity to ask questions about, you know, how should you maintain relationships with founders? How many meetings should you take with them? Um, At what point should you say no? Or like, you know. (laughs) How do you be helpful? Like, how, how can you help with business development for a founder that you've recently invested in? Things like that. Um, how do you think about work? Um, so, sharing the economy was, you know, very big a few years ago. How did you consider that as a, a market opportunity? And how, how do you take that into account when you're investing in different companies? Deal sourcing. Like, it literally covers every single thing. And it was very eye-opening to me, even though I had already gone to business school, there were venture capital classes, things like that. Um, but it was it was great to have real-life personal stories and anecdotes and approaches to help craft mine. What was one of the things that you learned that shocked you, that you were like, whoa, I didn't know I had to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing that shocked me the most is that I heard the, the like, Multiple times throughout the session, um, there was a comment that uh, capital is a commodity, right? And just kind of given where, given where the market is right now, um, we're in a bull market. There's a lot of capital flowing around. So in, in, you know, yes, that is true. But then I think about founders of color, you know, whether it's black men, women, et cetera, Hispanic, et cetera, we're still not getting funding. And so there's a big disconnect between this narrative of 
capital be a commodity and then the money actually flowing down to other founder, you know, underrepresented founders. And so that was top of my mind throughout um, each of the sessions really is just like, okay, like it's great knowledge. I hear what you guys are saying. Like this is all making sense. And yes, it's true. But the narrative is not necessarily the same um, for underrepresented founders. And I think that as time goes on, you know, we are seeing underrepresented founders getting funding and securing funding and, and getting, you know, access to different accelerators and things like that. But that definitely was top of mind for me. Yeah, that's so interesting because you see these stories where these founders go in. It's like their first time and they raise a huge round. Huge round. <laughs> and then you have <laughs> Harvard grads who have experience in building companies and they can't raise a million dollars. It's like, wait, what? I'm so confused. So like what's happening? Yes. I think there's definitely a lot. I think there's a lot going on. Like, um, obviously, there's bias throughout the experience because um, the nature of it in general is that it is very unstructured. Most of the time, early founders, you don't have a lot of data to go off of. You're not even, you know, you're not generating revenue even sometimes, right? And so that allows a lot of bias to come in. And so I think that happens. And then there's also this question of um, that kept coming up a lot is, you know, is this company venture back? backable, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Does it make sense for this company to take on venture funding, which again, (laughs) is can also be very biased. Um, And so it's it's kind of understanding the language um, that they're using, how they're thinking about decision making, and then also realizing like, you know, there is a lot of bias in, in the process. And so what I think is great is that a lot of people who are in these communities, so like myself and others, are like, hey, I want to be part of the change for this and kind of use the understanding and learning to actually invest in founders who look like us and help change the narrative, right? So I, I do think there's there's a lot of work that will still need to happen, just like on the big tech side with recruiting and retention. Um, on the investing side, um, there's still a lot that needs to that needs to happen. Yeah, I love it. But you're championing both sides right now, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> you are showing up for everybody at this point. Okay, so I'm super excited about everything that you have going on. I'm loving that you're able to balance it all as a working woman and having a company and investing in all the things. Uh, (laughs) So, (laughs) So, and having a personal life at that, right? So, how do we tap into what you've got going on? Um, Sure. And so, uh, if you're a black woman working in tech, the tech ecosystem, or you're an entrepreneur, um, you can actually join the Black Tech Women Facebook group. That's the easiest way. Um, it's just facebook.com slash group slash Black Tech Women. And then you'll have access to um, content, uh, questions, opportunities, etc. If you're an ally, then you can follow um, all of our content and updates on Instagram at Black Tech Women and then also on media at Black Tech Women. And so we'd love the support there. Um, and then for me, you know, I guess if you're interested <laughs> in what I'm up to, I do try to post updates on LinkedIn and so you can connect with me there or um, reach out. So I loved everything that Andrea talked about in regards to being an entrepreneur and having an actual real job. Like when you're actually going into a nine to five working a full day, but then having this side gig or having this situation where you're building something else. I think that's such a new age situation. And there's so many different ways to navigate that. But I want to kind of leave you guys with a couple of tips that I've learned over time when you're doing both and you're doing the most, (laughs) because that's kind of what's going on. But I feel like it's totally something you can accomplish. So How do you balance that life as an entrepreneur with your real job, right? There's this thing called an intrapreneur where a lot of tech companies will allow you to actually build product while you're there and they own that product. So be very, very clear about what specifically the regulations are for your company because the last thing that you want to do is build something and figure out later down the line that you have no ownership over that. I think that that's something that you have to 
touch upon in the very beginning to make sure that whatever you're building out, you actually do get to keep in terms of the value and the equity percentages. And there's no splits and there's nothing in the gray area, right? Another thing that I would say is make sure you get done what you actually need to get done for the job itself. So, of course, you're going to have some downtime. If it's permitted, go ahead and work on your project. Go ahead and work on your company. Be very transparent with whoever it is that you are working for, that that's something that you're doing if it's necessary. If it's a baby project and you feel like it's going to cause more strife than it needs to, then maybe that's not a conversation that needs to be had. But if it's something that's public facing and you're starting to get traction for it and people are starting to see you, and of course it's connected to your LinkedIn or your other social media platforms, you kind of want to say something because then you're like blindsiding the company, right? Some companies can take offense to it. So just be very transparent about what you're building so that If necessary, you guys can have a conversation. Also, I would say allocate time to both, right? Because you're going to be working this nine to five. A lot of people in Silicon Valley will call it moonlighting. So at nighttime, you're working on your passion projects or your other organization or your other company or whatever you decide or deem necessary for what you're working on. Just make sure you actually schedule time for that because it's really easy to get swamped with your 9 to 5, get home, cook, chill out, watch some TV, do all the things, and then you're like, okay, wait a minute, nothing got done for the other company that I'm working on. So make sure that you're balancing both of them. Make sure you're actually putting in in your schedule, okay, from this time to this time, I'm going to actually work on this other company because that's really the only way that it's going to happen. If you don't schedule it, it's likely that it's not going to get done. And then you'll look back six months later and you haven't really gotten far with this other passion project or your other company, right? You want to make sure that you're also gaining traction as time is moving forward. So you're building simultaneously and you don't look back and you're like, okay, wait, nothing actually got bills, right? Or very little got bills when you could have had a whole lot more progress by building and scheduling that time. So I think that's super important. Lastly, I want to say don't do the work on the job unless it's permitted. So you've had a conversation with your team. You've had a conversation with your boss. They're like, yeah, it's cool. You know, you have this side gig. If they're like, okay, you're building something as an entrepreneur and it's a part of the ecosystem or it's a part of the company culture that people are building businesses, then go ahead, do the work, right? But if you're building something and you know it's going to be a conflict and you know that it's going to be something that they're going to side eye you about because you're working on this during actual business hours, then I would say be a little bit more aware, self-aware, right? And maybe, like I said earlier, table it until you get home and you can work on it during those allocated hours that you scheduled. So that would be my advice if you're looking to actually build a company while you're still at your job. And this is a good segue for people who are actually in transition stage because a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, when do I actually take that leap? If I now want to transition into my own company versus working at this company that you're at, right? And so I would say making sure that you have at least three to four months of income. I know that sounds crazy to some people, but at least three to four months of savings before you make that jump because you have a pad. As an entrepreneur, nine times out of 10, you are spilling all of your money into that company. So you aren't really generating a lot of revenue in the beginning until you're actually scaling. So you want to make sure that you're focusing 100% on putting the money back into the company. And the last thing that you want to be thinking about is how you're going to pay rent next month, right? You want to make sure that you crossed all those T's, dotted all of those I's so that you can be comfortable because when you're in a mode of desperation, it ain't cute. It is not cute at all. And all of a sudden, you don't give up about the company because you're trying to survive, right? So you don't want to be operating from a space of scarcity. You want to be operating from a space of abundance, knowing you have three to four months to build out a company. It takes at least three months to test the market to make sure that your product is viable to the market. So you got to pad in that time and then you're investing into marketing and sales and customer service and all these things 
that you got to make sure that you are aware of, right? So making sure that you have at least an allocated budget to live is uber important. And on top of that, a lot of people, for whatever reason, I don't know if this is a media thing where they're like, oh, this person started their company on $100. You don't need money to start your company. You need some money to start your company. I cannot safely say to anybody that you should go quit your job and not have an income stream coming in and just be like trying to start a company. That to me is uncomfortable. I mean, if you want to take that jump without the parachute, by all means, I'm not a person that's like doing any leaping to that extreme, but you know, some people do. Some people want to live the ramen noodle diet. I'm not that kid, but you know, if you are, so be it. Right. So From my standpoint, my recommendation, have your three to four months of cushion so that you can comfortably make sure that you're building out this company. And if you do not have three to four months of cushion, keep your right where you're at. You need to sit there and build internally while you're still on salary so that you are comfortable, right? And that would be my advice from anybody who's trying to make that transition from having a nine to five to actually becoming an entrepreneur. All that said, you may not want to have anything to do with entrepreneurship. You may just want to land a job at Meta or Google or Apple and follow in Andrea's shoes. And if that's the case, we can help. Either way, we can help because we have a coaching program that will help guide your career, land you at a major tech company, or help you with that entrepreneurship transition. If you're interested, log on to www dot hollywood to silicon valley dot com that's hollywood to silicon valley dot com we offer one-on-one coaching or a program on demand to get you where you want to go in your career it's life hacks life hacking baby tech tips and tools for everyday needs tap in control copy these shortcuts and simplify your life you heard us all right, guys, so here is a life hack for you that I learned from my boy, Dominique Brown, founder of Your Finances Simplified. A lot of people know about taking out business loans, but did you know that you could take out a business line of credit? Here's the difference. A business loan means you have to pay it back right away. So say you took out a loan for $10,000. As soon as that loan hits your account, by the next month, you're going to have to start paying that loan back. If you take out a business line of credit, then you only have to pay back what you spend. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of tips on how to go about getting a business line of credit. So first and foremost, you want to choose a legal business name. So you're going to do that by going to the USPTO's website and you're going to search your business entity to make sure no one else has your name. Because, I mean, if that happens, then there's a chance of a lawsuit and we don't want to go there. So first things first, make sure you secure your name. After that, you have to form a legal business entity. I'm not going to get into too many of the details, but the different entities are a DBA, which means you're doing business as an LLC, a C Corp or an S Corp. If you're going to go the C or S Corp route or even an LLC, you want to obtain an attorney just to get some feedback because you want to make sure you're doing it correctly the first time around. Or if you already know, go ahead and select which corp makes the most sense for your business. After that, you want to get an EIN, which is an employee ID number. This is going to identify your business and allow you to go ahead and get that credit when it's time to apply. Fourth, you're going to file any permits or licenses that you need to file, and you're going to do that with a small business administration. Next, you're going to go to a bank that is a part of the Small Business Financial Exchange, and you're going to open up a business bank account. So next, you're going to get your DUNS number. That's D-U-N-S number. You're going to go to the specific website to get that. And it's going to identify your business. Now, here's where it actually gets interesting. Your personal credit and your business credit are two very different things. Your DUNS number is actually going to show you what your business credit is going to be. 
And it's going to give you a score from zero to 100. And within that, you're going to see if you actually would qualify for a business line of credit or if you don't. So the lower your DUNS number is, the least likely you will be able to qualify for that credit. The higher it is, the better. In addition to that, you're also going to have to open up some trade lines, but I am not going to get into that right now. You guys have to do your research on that. So those are my tips. Lastly, you're going to pull two credit scores from Experian and Equifax. Like I said earlier, they are not the same as your personal credit. So make sure you're pulling the right scores. And that, my friends, will help you get your business line of credit so you can get that business off the ground. So all you guys out there complaining, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no money. I just gave you the jewels. You're welcome. This is The Plug. You know who's The Plug. It's time to get caught up on the hottest in tech. Keep it locked, you heard. With Sequoia Blodgett. I see you, little mama. So what is commas, you ask? We are an entrepreneurship community that helps you get support on your journey to financial freedom. So Commas is a community of like-minded startup entrepreneurs with a goal of being profitable. We focus on helping founders gain an understanding of how to build online, digital, and tech-enabled businesses through courses, coaching, and support. So throughout that process, what we'll do is we take you through a four-month program, and you'll learn different courses that have focus points in entrepreneurial mindset, product development, branding, marketing, sales, publicity, fundraising, basically every single touch point of your business. And not only that, you're going to understand business formation because you can know all of that stuff, but if you don't have a legitimate business, then you're stopping in your tracks, right? We have a one-on-one session with amazing coaches that span everywhere from mental health to legal, brand, and finance, not to mention your you're also going to have group coaching and a mastermind where you're going to collaborate with your fellow peers and get feedback on your business as well. So we're an all-inclusive community to make sure that you're getting your company moving from point A to point B. And we also have live events. Our previous event was done in partnership with Gary Vaynerchuk and Draper. So, you know, we get to popping over here. So if you guys are interested in learning more about the Commas Club, log on to www.commasclub.com. 